Welcome to Emphasis Added, a podcast by the Houston Law Review, where we highlight legal issues with prominent lawyers and discuss the study and practice of law. I'm your host, Kevin Donovan. Welcome to the Law School Real Talk series with the Houston Law Review, where current law students share their experience and advice on how to navigate your first year in law school. Today, I'm joined by Shannon Wright and Charisma Gepto. Charisma is the editor in chief of the Houston Law Review, and Shannon's the uh, managing editor. So, welcome to the show, Shannon and Charisma. Thank you. Excited to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. And uh, great, great to have you all. And uh, just so everybody knows, you know, we're, we're going to get into what a managing editor and an editor in chief does a little bit. Uh, in short, Shannon and Charisma are uh, my bosses. So I'm going to be a little nicer to them than I am to uh, to most of my guests. <laughs> just kidding. No, no, no special treatment here. Um, but today we're going to be talking about the who, what, when, where, and why, maybe a little bit of the how, um, of law reviews and legal journals. So uh, before we get into all that, I just want to start with an opening question for both of you. And that is, um, when did you know that you wanted to do law review? Um, or when did you even learn about law reviews in the first place? And what made you want to do it? Yeah, I guess we'll start with Shannon. Yeah. Sure. So I actually learned about law reviews from my sister's boyfriend, who's an attorney. Okay. Uh, and when he found out that I had gotten into law school and was going to go to law school, he says, oh, you have to do law review because he had done law review and it had made him really an expert in blue booking to the point where other attorneys at his firm would bring him work to look at before they submitted it to a court okay. because he was the guy who knew like how to fix all of their citations and all of their grammar. And he said it really just gives you an edge as an attorney and gets you work. So, so, so is he the reason you're so good at blue booking then, Shannon? <laughs> I, I think I've surpassed his skills, actually. <laughs> He's, I'm hopefully going to send this to him and he can listen to that and maybe debate me about that. But yeah. I think I've surpassed his skills. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. I believe it. I believe it. Um, and uh, Charisma, how about you? Um, so I remember first hearing about a law review when President mm -hmm. Obama was elected because, oh, as wow. you all know, he was the first black editor-in-chief of the Harvard Law Review. Um, but I didn't know anything about the role. I thought it only made the news because it's Harvard and everything about Harvard makes the news. True. Um, but once I started law school, um, my torts professor, Professor Meredith Duncan, uh, she was actually on the Houston Law Review and she talked to me about Law Review and told me that I should join because it's a really great opportunity. It opens doors in terms of employment opportunities. And then just getting to meet other students and learning about the Blue Book and the skills that you get um, being a member of the Law Review and how they can transfer to work. Um, and so that's when I decided maybe I should join it because I trust everything that Professor Duncan says. That's true. I, I've heard great things. I, I'm yet to have Professor Duncan, which I know is, is almost sinful, but I just never lined up. But uh, so my story is actually much closer to yours, Shannon, uh, where my wife um, was at Baylor Law Review and published through Law Review. And I was like, well, I mean, naturally, I have to also do that. Right. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, she didn't she didn't get in as much into the, the perks and everything. Uh, but but we definitely will for this episode, and so we will uh, <laughs> we we will go into the why you should do law review a little more than than what Charisma just said. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely happy I did it. But I think now we'll move into to the what the the what about law reviews and law journals. We'll, we'll use those terms a little bit interchangeably. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, first we should just talk in a very general sense about what a law journal is. So what is a law journal? I'll let either of you jump in. Yeah, okay. yeah, feel free to jump yeah, in. Yeah, I mean, it's essentially, it's a publication of legal scholarship. And the really cool thing about most law journals in the country is that we actually publish both professional pieces and student pieces. So the Houston Law Review will publish articles that are written by uh, professors or judges or practicing attorneys, as well as students who are on the law review. Um, and so that's just something that's really cool because you get the lens of students who are living through these like real life legal issues and then also from professors and um, professionals who may have more experience in the actual area of law that they're writing about. Yeah, absolutely. The yeah. other thing that's really cool about law journals that is, I think, unique to law is mm -hmm. that the journals are all run by students. So you think about like medicine or social science or any other discipline, those are run by professionals in the field. And the opportunity to be on a law review or a law journal as a student is, is kind of unique, that you get to be in this role of deciding what scholarship gets published and whose voice gets elevated in the discourse. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that really surprised me is that like the law review is its like own like 501c3 nonprofit, right? I mean, it's its own company that is run, has its own board, which are professors, right? 
Alumni as well. Alumni, yeah. okay, professors and alumni. Mm -hmm. But then also like, yeah, the whole like structure of the actual like, I guess like company or whatever is, is running is all student run, which is really interesting. Yeah, so. um, and I think the, the cool part about it is also, right, we're still a student organization and so we're still heavily involved with the University of Houston Law Centers, other student organizations, we are required to do everything else that every other student organization has to do, but we're also a self-sustaining organization. And so making sure that we're actually, you know, getting our subscriptions and making sure that we are, you know, getting the donations and everything that we need to still function in addition to any funds that we get from the school. I think it's just like a really unique opportunity because we are running a corporation essentially. Yeah, which also means, because uh, a lot of people really don't, means we got our own budget, which means we can throw really cool events. So. <laughs> <laughs> or have a podcast. Yeah, yeah or, have, or have a podcast. Right, exactly. Um, and then I think moving on from there, what I, probably what most people listening to this uh, episode are going to be wondering about is what do people do on Law Review? And I think in particular, we'll start with what do two L's do on Law Review? And so maybe maybe to start, Shannon, you probably you probably deal with uh, a lot of them now with the first issue coming out. So uh, I guess to start, what does site checking look like? What is site checking? So site checking is basically where you're going to go through the piece that the author has submitted, whether it's a professional author or a student author, and you're going to check not only the form of their citations to make sure that it fits the blue book, but you're going to check the substantiation. So what that means is you know, the author has said this statement and then they've cited this source. Well, does that source support that statement? And if it doesn't, then we need to find a source that does. So it's checking both what the author is saying, are they fully backing that up? And then are they saying it in the right way? Are they following the Blue Book rules? Are they following, we also use uh, the Green Book in Texas. So there's all kinds of different book. books that we use <laughs> in order to make sure that those authors are uh, producing the best quality piece that they can. Right. And that's something that's something you mentioned that I think is kind of interesting, which kind of plays into like, what is the difference between a law review or a law journal and like maybe like a, a news article, you know, public like publication or something like that, where like every single word is substantiated, but it's also a much longer process, right? Mm -hmm. Like how, how long does that process take from receipt of um, anyone, a student or a professional's article, and then actually that going and being published? Um, and actually, in our, for our process, it takes a couple of months. And so our first issue, we received the final draft of our manuscripts in May, and we will not publish this first issue until October. Um, and so we take the articles through many rounds of editing, um, site checking being one of those rounds of editing. And then we have more senior editors who get to look at the article and, and make their own edits. And then we, of course, will send the article back to the authors so that they can see the edits that we've made, give us new suggestions, things like that. Um, so it takes a couple of months, um, and sometimes, of course, we'll have issues that are overlapping, and so we'll start on, like, the second issue while we're still working on the first, which lends, you know, to why it's sometimes really busy being on to Law Review. extra work. <laughs> <laughs> but it also ensures, yeah. of course, that we're done with our issue by the time we graduate, which is great because no one wants to come back to the Law Review office after graduation to finish off an issue. Right, and so, and so I'll talk really quick about maybe what you all are wondering about here, which is... Okay, like that's that sounds great. How many hours are we looking at here, right? And I, I'm curious what you two think about this as well. Um, but and don't worry, we're gonna get into the why. So if this if, don't get scared off at this part of the episode. Um, but like, how many hours? I think for me, would it take? So there's multiple steps. Like you're you're gonna get your initial side check, and you're gonna look for sources and things. And so different parts of that process take different amounts of time. For me, um, I would say it probably took like uh, each issue maybe like 40 hours ish you know give or take and so give or take like 10 hours um and so i think that that's probably and, and i'm curious what you all think your times i know shannon was super efficient i didn't i don't know if i worked on a lot of articles with you charisma but i remember always looking and seeing that shannon had already completed everything <laughs> like the day i started and i started early so, so yeah so curious i mean how, how are your experiences as as two l's if you can think back so I would say for me, it was probably about 20 to 40 hours a week, just depending on how hard the article was. And mm -hmm. I think the important thing to remember in our process, and I'm sure every journal has a little bit different process, but we have basically five hard weeks 
for two L's because mm-hmm. we have five issues per volume right. and there's one side check week for each of those issues. So that's like the week where you're putting in the most effort. Yeah. Um, and those are the weeks that take the longest. And, and the rest of the time you have a lot of weeks where you have breaks, you have weeks where you have what we call kickbacks, which are fixing things that you didn't do right. And if you did them all right the first time, then hey, you don't have any kickbacks. So. Like, it's a huge thing to note. Take, take time in that first side check to like figure out processes, figure it out because like, I don't know if I ever had zero, but I got pretty close. I got pretty close. And then it's just like, all right, like one week of hard work and that's mm-hmm. it. Yeah, it's, it's a great feeling when you pull up that, you know, kickback bin and see like you've only got a couple. That's, that's a great feeling because you know your week is going to be pretty easy. Right, yeah. Um, I'll be honest, I'm terrible with estimating time. <laughs> and I'm also a perfectionist. And so I also probably spend more time on things than is required because yeah. I don't ever believe that it's good enough until I'm out of time. Um, so for me, I've never really like paid attention to the amount of time that it would take me to do site check. It was Mm -hmm. always just this goal of getting it done and getting it done correctly the first time. So when I was thinking about joining the law review, I talked to folks who were on law review and folks who, um, were alums and everyone hands down told me like, your goal should be to just do it correctly the first time. Like the three L's are really great editors. They're going to catch your mistakes. So don't try to cut any corners. Mm -hmm. And then also that one week can be your busiest week if you do it correctly. And then as we were saying, you get no kickbacks. And so every site check week, that was my goal. It's like my goal is to get as few kickbacks as possible. And then eventually when I started to get kickbacks, I was just like, no, I shouldn't have gotten a kickback. Like by the fifth issue, you know, I'm like, all right, you know, but that's the goal, right? It's right. like, just do it correctly the first time. And I found that it really did free up my schedule. Um, and it helped me with planning, right? Cause I could look forward to knowing like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm going to get maybe five kickbacks at most. I'm going to have a free week. I, I mean, really you could do that on the day it's due or you could do that the first day and then you have yeah. the entire week. So you can plan your time out really well if you just do it correctly. Yeah, and also the way, I mean, we do things, and d- disclaimer for people listening, like everything, obviously our experience is as the Houston Law Review, yeah. but I mean, it's, correct me if, I'm, if you've heard differently, but a lot of law reviews, I think, fun- function and operate in a somewhat similar fashion. So this is probably decent general advice, mm-hmm. um, especially for people in, in Houston, but really, really anywhere in the US, I'm, I'm, I imagine a lot of them operate pretty similarly. I think one of the things that we do that maybe other law reviews do is we talk about, or, or we, we give those side checks at times where it's not gonna be as strenuous on you for like grades and those sorts of things. So like, I think what, at least one of ours is done in the summer before class starts, right? Mm-hmm. And then we do another one like in during winter break. And so, and we never do them during finals. Yeah. And so I think that's like a, a big factor. Yeah, that's, I think, I mean, that's a major part of Shannon's role is to really figure out our schedule for the year. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's really intentional about making sure that we're really mindful of those times when students will be the most busy. And considering they other they have other law review requirements as well, we also try to take that into account when we're planning to ensure that students aren't doing their site checks, which are really a busy time, as mm-hmm. well as like writing their note or comment, which I believe we're going to get into later. That's exactly. What um, I'm get so into we that. we yeah. try to make sure that 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 we keep that in mind because right. they're students first. And at the end mm-hmm. of the day, like if if students aren't graduating, then their law review work ultimately probably won't matter, right? Because yeah. you're, not a, you're not a lawyer. So um, we just try to be really intentional about those things. But it is, it is a lot of work and we don't hide that, but we, we believe and we know that you can be successful on law review if you just plan your time well. Absolutely. And I think to what you were saying, Kevin, in terms of how the schedule lays out, you know, we laid the whole schedule out back in May of yeah. last year. Um, and we looked at the academic calendar. And so, like you said, we have one issue that's during the summer yep. where the, the 2L work is during the summer. Their second site check is going on next week. So that's only the second week of classes for us. And then they're yeah. already done with two of their five site checks. Right. We've got one more in the fall. They have one that falls during the winter break just before the start of the second semester and then one during the entirety of the second semester. So we really try to to plan it out with the calendar so that it's not like they're getting slammed at times when they're really going to be slammed with classwork. Yeah. And making sure that we don't have anything going on when we try to graduate. That's right. (laughs) Yes. Got to keep that time clear. So Chris, you mentioned um, what the note and comment writing, you mentioned the note and comment writing. And I'm I'm very curious, like, what is that requirement? Um, and, and obviously we can't speak to everyone, but what is that requirement for the Houston Law Review? 
Um, so for the Houston Law Review to maintain good standing membership, you every student has to write a note or a comment. Um, so a note is usually a piece where you're going to look at a legal issue. You're trying to find something that's timely, but you're also looking for something that's novel. Mm -hmm. um, and you're actually going to make a recommendation in terms of a solution to that issue. Um, whereas a comment, you're also looking for a legal issue that's timely and novel, but you're not necessarily required to make any recommendations for the solution. Um, you're, you can just analyze the issue and just lay out all the arguments and different sides, and, and that's enough. But every student has to write a piece that is of publishable quality. Right. Um, as we mentioned, we do publish our student notes and and our comments, um, and so we have to make sure that that every piece could essentially get published if the student wants to, or even if the journal needs it. If we right. need to fill an issue, we may have to pull a student piece, and and it has to be something that we could send to print. So yeah, um, That's that's the requirement, and the cool thing, of course, is that the students get to choose. The, their topic. So no one's, we can give them some guidance and we can suggest professors that they can talk to and things like that. But this is really an opportunity for students to write about an area of interest for them. Right. Um, that maybe we don't have a course at the law center that talks about an area of law that they're interested in. So it's a really great opportunity. Um, and it's just a really great way to get published and to get, you know, your scholarship out there if that's something you want to do. And I'm curious, how did you all decide on what you wrote on? So I had been watching the Fifth Circuit opinions that come out every day. They come out at like 12.10 and 6.10 every okay. single day. I get an email push uh -huh. for opinions that come out. And I saw one that was a petition for rehearing on Bonk that was denied, and it was denied in an 8-8 eight to eight vote. And there were two dissents. And I thought, that's really interesting. That's got to be an issue where, you know, there are some people who have differing views on the same topic. Right. It was about a uh, censure of a local Houston Community College system trustee okay. by the Board of Trustees. Uh, and he had sued for a Section 1983 injury um, mm -hmm. as a result of the censure. And so it ended up, I, I started writing about that because I thought the government speech issue that was kind of tied in with this case was really interesting. And government speech is an area that is very murky. The Supreme Court has right. very few cases on it. We read them in con law, and I got my con law professor to help me out with mm -hmm. uh, reading the piece and giving me feedback, which was a great way to further develop that relationship. And then actually the case recently got granted cert at the Supreme Court, so there are going to be oral arguments on November 2nd. So I'm ah. excited to see if the court ends up taking up the government speech issue, which is one of three ways uh -huh. that the petitioner says that they could side with them. Um, and if they do, what direction they end up coming out. So it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. So, so I'm curious. I, I wanted to talk about this a little bit later in the episode, but so you're publishing, right? Yes. And are you an issue one? Yes. So you're going to come out before the court That's makes right. any yeah. decision. Yeah, we're, we're going to come out before the court even has oral arguments. And so, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, some of the judges' clerks, the justices' clerks will see the piece and yeah. maybe find something interesting in it. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, I was worried about my topic uh, losing relevance, but thanks to the Delta variant, it has not. <laughs> the one, the one silver lining. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that a little more. Um, for me, I, I was kind of similarly like reached out to a Kalma professor. Where, where it minds about um, like coronavirus and interstate quarantine measures, and so um, one of our professors kind of did a few classes, just very like high level overview stuff on that. And so I'd reached out to him just to talk a little bit more with something I was interested in, obviously something that affects all of our lives. And I was like, you know, I'd like to do something that's like relevant to me and, and just kind of interesting and interested in me. And so that's kind of where I went and he had, I had had an idea and he was like, eh, that's okay. But like the, doing it this way would be a more interesting take that would be much more novel. And so that's really what kind of drew me to take the, the angle that I took but I think the topic on my own was just something that I was interested in. Um, what about you, Krista? Um, I also reached out to my con law professor. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, shout out to the con law professor. Just, just to note, I think con law articles are normally like the most published, but I think in our class in particular, maybe because of the times, um, that happened to be a pretty, a pretty big thing. Yeah. Um, so I reached out to my con law professor and I told him that I was interested in either some area that dealt with education or um, policing. And so okay. he actually started talking to me about policing and insurance. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up looking at, um, or I ended up actually recommending changes to policing such that ultimately states will then require police officers to get professional liability insurance. Um, so there's this whole like way that I go about it, but essentially yeah. using uh, federal funds and regulating how states get federal funds, one of the requirements could be um, giving states additional money if they require their officers to get um, insurance. 
So I checked in with him about that, and he said he thinks it's a good solution. So we'll see what happens when it gets published. But okay. Um, but yeah, and then also reaching out to another another professor who was like he was very well versed in First Amendment law and other okay. constitutional issues, and just double checking that like I didn't miss anything and getting his perspective on it as well. So yeah, definitely suggest reaching out to professors and practitioners for these issues because it's really a great way to build relationships. Well, since you and I had the same column, law professor, shout out to Professor Seth Chandler. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your help. Um, yeah, yeah, and it, it's, the t I think the topic, like, deciding, figuring out process is kind of stressful, and so that's why I kind of want to go into that a little bit in depth. It's not like, and, and I think that's something everyone needs to know, you don't, you don't need to publish, you know, but you, you want to write something that's that level, and also you learn a lot during that process, mm -hmm. and we'll go a little more into, like, the skills you gain from law review and the why, but I think that, you know, it seems stressful at first, but you're going to realize that you do end up learning a lot as a 1L. And so there's going to be a lot of ideas floating that you can kind of explore a little more in depth. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's cool to be not a subject matter expert necessarily, like, but it's just cool to get more expertise on like a specific area of law, I think. So, I, I think also that. not forgetting about your life before law school. I think, yeah. of course, law school is very consuming. And uh -huh. so you feel like, you know, all you're thinking about are the cases and things like that that you're reading and, right. and you will. But also remembering what you were passionate about before mm -hmm. you got to law school matters. Um, and I think that that can also help with shaping your topic a yeah, lot absolutely. Um, as well. So I'd like to, so we've talked about the two L's, but hopefully any, anyone that wants to do law review uh, makes it to three L. And so curious also to talk about what do three L's do on law review? And so I figure what better place to start than what do, what do you all do? Um, what, what does your job entail? Um, so. Unlike the title, I think a lot of people mm -hmm. think that as the editor-in-chief, my job is only to do the editing work. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the case. Of course, editing is a major part of my job. Um, I make the final decisions about our articles and our issue overall before they go to print. Um, but I also have to manage our team, right? And so we yeah. have editors that do different things, like you're our podcast editor. We have someone in charge of our finances. We have a whole other team that's in charge of our notes in our comments and guiding the two L's through that process. And so my job is to essentially make sure that it's like to make sure that all of those teams are functioning and that they're functioning well and that they're well yeah. supported um, in addition to the editing. And so it's, it's fun because I get to work with all the three L's and I get to also work with a lot of the two L's because I do the editing work. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially I just have to make sure that we stay afloat. Like I <laughs> just have to make sure that we continue to run as a journal. Um, and of course, a part of that is making sure that all of our teams well supported, because I know that if if anyone's struggling and if anyone falls off on their duties, then then we cannot function. Right. right. Like if our editors stop editing, then we don't have a journal. And if our finance person falls off, then we don't have a budget. So that's really my job is to just manage to manage the entire team and to make sure that we function. Right. You talk to the higher ups too, the, the, the board and the... the yes, and I do. Yeah, I play that role yeah. as well. I guess I don't think about that as often because we are a student run journal and all mm -hmm. the decisions that we make pertaining to our journal are right. ours. But I do True. get a lot of guidance from our faculty advisors. Mm. Um, we also have the board of directors and there are some things that I do have to run through the board of directors and we have our meetings, but they also help to just guide the journal. They're right. alums. They've all been in this role or other roles on the journal and they just really care about making sure that we are mindful of all the different things that we need to think of when we're making decisions pertaining to the journal. Right. And then I guess on, on to you, Shannon, what, what does the managing editor do? So unlike Charisma's title, my title is actually, I think, perfectly descriptive of what I do. <laughs> so on the Manage editing, editing side, yes, managing and editing, uh -huh. kind of two separate roles. So on the, on the editing side, I'm doing a similar role as Charisma, which is that we're both doing high level editing work. Uh, after the two L's have already done yeah. their work, we're coming back in and making sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and we haven't missed anything. And then on the managing side, I'm scheduling our personnel, all of our editing personnel, the two L's, the three L's who are editors, all those people on all of the issues and the articles within those issues. So I have to look at, you know, how long is each article? How many people do we have? Yeah. How many packet, we call them packets, um, which is like how many citations, total citations do you have? If you have a long string site, you mm -hmm. might have like eight or 10 packets in one footnote. So count all of those up, figure out where our people are gonna go, try to balance out people's strengths. 
Um, and then also handling discipline is the managing side. So that's the least fun part of my job, but it's... That's why I'm being nice to her. <laughs> you know, so, sometimes it's necessary. I mean, I, yeah. think, I think the main thing that our board has tried to focus on instilling with both our board and the board coming up behind us is uh -huh. just the importance of communication. Mm -hmm. right. I think for anybody who's thinking about going on a law review, it's going to help you develop that professional skill mm -hmm. of communicating the things that are going on in your life outside of these commitments. Um, right. And letting people know when things come up and, and that you need to, you know, you need some help or you need a little bit of extra time or something like that. Yeah. Uh, that kind of skill to develop that in law review and be ready to go in the workplace, I think is just really important. Shannon's not giving herself enough credit because another major part of her role is to make sure that I stay on track. Like she <laughs> yeah. is truly, I told her that the other day, like she's truly my right hand when it comes to all this. So like she helps me with making a lot of these decisions and she also like has to make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do as well as managing the 2L. So it's it's a tough job, I'm well, a lot yeah. of work. And, and giving credit where credit is due, uh, we have another person who's kind of at the top of yes. the board, um, which is Kirsten Williams, who is our- She was on a past episode. Chief of, of Articles series. Editor. So you can <laughs> yeah. check out that episode and get to meet Kirsten, she's great. So kind of the three of us uh -huh. are the ones who end up, Charisma has the final call, but the three of us are the ones who kind of talk together and, and make those decisions or help guide Charisma. She's making the decision. Um, so it's it's a really great group, and yeah. and I'm really excited to work with both of these talented women. Right. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's a, a key thing to note is that like there are these like multiple leadership positions. There's obviously both of yours and, and Kirsten's, which are which are really high level, broad. There's also I think Tom, Thomas does like the notes and comments. We have a Darby runs the actual like website, the Houston Law Review online okay. or electronic. Mm -hmm. um, podcast editor, you know, got a big team, big team beneath me. <laughs> um, and then, and then, but like, besides that, there, there's also non-leadership positions. Cause I, I think some people might get a little bit intimidated thinking that, you know, these are the only positions we have about 30 people in our class. Is that right? 35, mm -hmm. I think 35. total in our class. So yeah, there are a yeah. lot of different roles. If you That's just, only a few. If you just like the editing side, uh -huh. there are roles that just do the editing side. If you don't really want to touch the editing side ever again after 2L, we've got yeah. roles where you just barely have to touch it. We occasionally mm -hmm. loop you in for a site check. Uh, but we have people who do things like uh, alumni development, uh, community service, you know, there are all kinds of different areas because right. um, in addition to being a law review, as, as uh, Charisma mentioned before, we're a student organization and we try to embody the spirit of student organizations in terms of connecting current students with alums, going out into the community and doing community service and, and just generally serving as a place where people can grow and develop as people. Right. Yeah. And I think that's another thing that I enjoy about my role is like, yes, I have to make the final decisions, but it's also learning how to trust my team. Like, as you mentioned, there are a lot of leaders on my team and like recognizing the strengths and the weaknesses in, in my teammates, that matters a lot. Right. Um, and I think that that's the cool part about being on the law review is like, if you are a chief of something, mm -hmm. like as the editor in chief, I need to trust that you're going to lead your team effect. Like you were elected for that role, just like I was elected. And so I have to trust that you have the skills to lead your team. Right. And so giving people and like delegating those, those tasks to them so that they can then lead their own teams. And even if you're on the team and you're not the leader, you still have a lot of say in, in how our journal runs. And I think that that's, the nice part is you don't have to have a big title mm -hmm. in order to have an opinion about what the journal should and shouldn't be doing. And that's something that we really value as leaders of this journal is like, we want to hear everything, the good, the bad, the ugly. We want you all to know that you play a role in shaping the journal. And so we try not to get so caught up in titles, like they matter, but they don't matter in the sense of like how we function um, in interacting with our teammates. Everyone's a leader, everyone has a part to play, and everyone has a voice in, in how we run the journal. Right, yeah, and I, and I can vouch for that. Charisma does keep it pretty democratic, so. Which, which is it makes good. my job it's easier, and I have yeah. to make all decisions. And, 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 really and, I, and I do too, I, I, I do consult uh, others, and I, I definitely have consulted Charisma a few times, and, and you know, she tries to avoid my calls, but yeah, sometimes I get her, and <laughs> talk to her about the episodes for longer than probably she has time for. <laughs> Um, but spe speaking of time, I, I think that's the last probably part I want to touch on kind of the 3L side of things is what does that 3L time commitment look like? And it's probably a span, right? Because there's obviously a lot of different roles. Um, and so just wondering if you two could kind of talk to that at all. Again, I'm terrible with estimating time, but yeah. I will say, of course, that in, in my role, um, I'm doing something for the law review every day, just uh -huh. about. Um, I try to balance my time and I'm still right. learning how to do all of that. Um, but you know, some days it might be responding to emails, other days it might actually be planning out a meeting, 
um, are actually doing the editing work. Of course, the editing work usually takes the longest, but right. I'm doing something for the law review every day. Um, but of course, that comes with the role. I think that's the nice part about the 3L years. You get to sort of pick what you want to do and what you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And of course, that comes with different time commitments. And so I think that there are other roles where they could go months without actually doing some work for the law review, maybe some editing work here and there, like Shannon mentioned. But Otherwise, they might not actually start on their role until the spring, like some of our notes and comments editors. Like they yeah. don't really get going until the spring when we're doing that sort of that work. So it varies, but right. um, I think the time commitment is is less as a three L, depending on your role, for sure. Yeah, I'd agree. I, I think there probably are a few leadership roles where it's where it's significantly more, but you yeah. you understand what you're signing yourself up for. Yeah, I think there's definitely opportunities to do less work um, as the podcast editor. It's a ton of work. No, I'm <laughs> My, my successor will already be chosen by the time this episode uh, publishes. So. <laughs> no, it's uh, no, it's good, and it, it really is like like I think a lot of the three hour rules. If you're on top of things, then you can kind of plan out your schedule and, and really kind of um, plot out your destiny and, and just kind of know what that's like. I mean, there are obviously some like like both of you alls that are gonna require things that might come up or are gonna be more daily, um, but you know you get to be the boss. So it's uh, everything has its perks. But even in our roles though, like they have, we have the busy times and we also have our times off. And that's the nice part about right. our planning ahead mm -hmm. is that we can also plan for those busier times yeah. um, as well. And so it's not, uh, yes, I might do something for the law review every day, but again, like it could be a five minute task or it could be, you know, a couple of hours. And so that's the right. nice part is that you can still have a life if you plan things well and you actually manage your time well. Um, and so it's, it's doable. It's all doable. It sounds like a lot, but it's just a matter of planning and communicating and trusting your team to support you when you need it. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. So, so we, we've kind of, we talked talk about a lot about like time commitments, right? And so I'm sure people are thinking now, uh, if, they, if they made it this long, all right, why should I do this? <laughs> why should I do any, any law journal or, or law reviews uh, in the first place? And so I think I like to talk a little bit about the skills and we've kind of alluded to them but what sorts of skills do you gain from being on a law journal or law review? Gosh, there are so many skills yeah. that you gain. So, you know, you get your blue booking skills, mm -hmm. um, you get your editing skills, you get professionalism skills in terms of writing professional emails. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Um, also, the attention to detail is really important um, as we're editing. Of course, we have to like really look for those errors and things like mm -hmm. that that most people might not see when they're first reading an article. Um, we also work together a lot, right? And so that team building is really important. Yeah. Um, I think we've suggested that a, a lot throughout this podcast thus far. Um, and then, of course, like employers know that law reviews are doing this type of work. And so yeah. just having that on your resume speaks volumes about what you're capable of doing without you having to really explain all that or demonstrate that. Like if you're able to make it onto the law review and do well, then employers can trust like, okay, they'll probably know how to blue book. They're probably, a, you know, at least a decent legal writer and they don't have to teach you those skills when you actually start practicing. Yeah. And I, I was going to, I was going to say, I think one of the parts of that too is like, they know that just like being employed, you have deadlines, you have requirements. And so like, they don't even have to look any further to know that you've already, you know, had to deal with those sorts of things, which, which as working for a law firm or working for a court, you're going to have deadlines and you're going to have things that you're going to have to meet. And you have to be able to manage your time with other clients or, or other workload. You have to manage it with your own family, with vacations, with whatever else you're doing. And in law school, you're going to have all these other things. So it, I think that like, shows that you can kind of hack it in, in a way. I think the other thing that law review adds in terms of skill development is taking a big task and breaking it down into small bites. Yeah. So if you think about the note and comment writing process, that's a huge task. You right. Know, you, you can just sit there and look at it and go, oh my gosh, this is this huge thing that I have to do. But you break it down into smaller pieces and you achieve those smaller pieces. And the same with the editing work, you know, mm -hmm. when you're doing site checking as a 2L, the beginning of the week, you have all of these packets. How do you right. take that huge task? and break it down into small pieces that you can achieve over the time that you have. And I think that kind of skill is really important for future lawyers because you know, you'll get this huge task, you'll get a deal that you're working on, or you'll get a case that's just come in. Yeah. And you've got to break it down into all those smaller bites and make uh -huh. sure that you're hitting your marks at the right time. So I think that skill especially is something that you really develop in law review. And maybe, maybe from a, like, to, to separate it out a little bit, I think a lot of people who go to law school start to decide like, I either want to be transaction or I want to litigate. 
And so I've only done the transactional side, so maybe, maybe I, I'll speak to that a little bit. I think, do both of you want to litigate? Is that right? Okay, yes. cool. Yes. So, so from the litigation side, what's maybe a little bit more focused? Like what do those skills look like that you're building that will help you be a good litigator? Um, I think for me, um, I'm going to clerk after graduation, right? And so thinking yeah. about working with a judge and working with other clerks and what does that look like in terms of me communicating my ideas mm -hmm. and asking those questions that are important to get me to the next step. Those are things that I'm, I'm finding that I'm having to learn as the editor in chief of the law review specifically, yeah. right? Like I have to lean on people. I have to ask questions of our board and our faculty in order to make decisions. Um, but then also of course, like the editing part of things, right? Like as a, as a law clerk, you're going to have to write things for the court. And so knowing how to phrase things, knowing how to cite, knowing how to research, that's mm -hmm. also a part of what we do when we're site checking. We have to go out and find those sources that, that we're going to use to substantiate. Right. And so knowing how to do those sorts of things, I think will help um, post-graduation. And then even going into practice, right? Like those are all skills that, are, that will be important um, in, in my role as a, as a law clerk and beyond. Yeah. And I'm a firm believer that you become a better writer by reading good writing. Yeah. And you read a lot of good writing on Law Review. You so you've got professors mm -hmm. who are you know, at the top of their game submitting pieces. You've got students who've written pieces. And you're also looking for like, where have they missed something? Is there a grammatical rule here that they need to be following that they didn't? So yeah. you're really paying attention to what good writing looks like. And I think that makes you a better writer. And I think that's really critical as a litigator too. Right, and, and looking for those things, I think, is what really plays into like the transactional side. I think there's some people in in like, by, but what I mean by transactional is like is like you know corporate stuff or, or things where you're not going to court and you're not doing like a lot of legal research, which is definitely part of law review and a big part. But like, and you're not even really doing a lot of writing necessarily. You'll draft, but you're not like writing memos or any anything like that necessarily. But like that attention to detail and that like, in like over my summer program, there was like contracts and things, and and a lot of times you know, you push something back up and, and what would come back would be like some commas and some ands or some commas that weren't before ands because we, we don't use the Oxford comma. Oh, <laughs> At no. my point, at least. Oh, um, no. Yeah, I know. Oh, oh pain. Um, and so, and it's just like, but those, those minor things can mean a lot. It can mean yeah. a lot in a contract. Um, looking for like, where are all the dates I need to change? And like in, in law review, especially when you're at the higher editing level and you're, you're sifting through and, and being like, that needs to be a comma, that needs to be italicized. I've heard, I've heard rumors that when you become a senior articles editor, you, uh, you really start to learn about, you still start to see those small nuances. You can, can see the it. italicized yes, you comma. Can see it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't yet see the italicized period, but I remember our previous editor in chief, Reagan, said that she could. So maybe by the end of the year, I'm going to be there. That you can also like spot that. differences in fonts when that, when that happened the yeah. first time to me, I, yeah. was, I was freaked out. And those things matter. Happened. I mean, those things matter to clients. Like they're, if they're paying a lot of money for your services, they don't want like, Calibri on one side and like Times New Roman in the next page. It's not or professional. Like, yeah, yeah. It doesn't it doesn't look good. It doesn't look clean. Um, and so I think that attention to detail is huge. I also like what you said, Shannon, about taking a big task and like making it into like small bite-sized chunks that you can kind of push through. Um, like I'm working part-time right now and one of the tasks that I was put on was a diligence project um, with like thousands and thousands of documents. And like, what did I do? Like like pretty much, and I, I don't, I wasn't thinking about it in the moment, but like now that you've said it, I'm thinking about it. And it's like, I took the task, took a couple of hours to really kind of figure out a system and like really digest the task and figure out like, these are the contract provisions I'm really looking for. This is like kind of how this company has generally laid them out. This is like the red flag areas. And then once I'd done that, which is like side check, you're going to, you're going to look through and you're going to be like, okay, like this, this author makes these mistakes more often than not. I'm going to kind of note that I'm going to, I'm going to figure out those rules that are going to apply to those things. And then once you've done it, you can start really rolling. And then mm -hmm. it, it goes from being a, a 45 hour task to a 30 hour task um, for a site check or in the diligence standpoint, you go from doing like five contracts an hour to like 40, um, which is crazy. And so, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, there's a lot of skills. There's a ton. Mm -hmm. I think it's on that side of thing. That's why employers like it. That's why I think I'm very, very glad I did it um, because it shows it, it's, it's really helped me like kind of be good at those sorts of things. Even like drafting emails. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you're like, 
oh, like some people have mistakes in their emails. Like, what's mm-hmm. going on here? <laughs> so. I think the important thing to also note um, is that a lot of law reviews and law journals in the country, mm-hmm. um, there's this perception that people who, who join a law review, they are going to go into big law. Mm-hmm. And something that we've really wanted to stress with our board and the, right. and the board that's coming in behind us is that you don't have to go into big law or have a desire to go into big law for the law review to be beneficial to your right. career. These skills that we, we're talking about are skills that you can use in any practice area like yeah we have folks who want to go into public interest work and government work those types of things you can also use these skills and i think that that's really important because one of my goals at least as eic has been to try to sort of debunk a lot of these misconceptions about law reviews right and like to show people that these are just skills that we're learning and yeah. and yes there are certain things and i know we're going to get into like the how do you join the law review and stuff uh-huh. there are certain things that come with that that You can have different opinions about and that's fine but at the end of the day we don't all have the same goals in terms of our careers and i think that 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 matters and that's important because we want a diversity of views when it comes to editing and when it comes to making decisions for the journal so at least for the houston law review we're not pushing people into big law at all if that's something you want to do we'll do it but if not then we want to connect people with other attorneys as well so that they can get into the the practice areas that they're interested in Right. And, and I mean, and like we've said, all these skills, I mean, any employer is going to like to see that you've done law review or any legal journal because they're going to know that they that these skills, you know, you've kind of gained that experience and that mm-hmm. expertise and are going to be able to immediately apply that once you start practicing. I think something that is definitely beneficial for all people that we haven't really talked a whole lot about yet. What are the networking opportunities for people that do law review or, or a law journal? Um, so I think Shannon mentioned this before. We do have someone on our board, um, an alumni developments editor. And so his role is to essentially set up these networking yeah. opportunities for our 2Ls and for our 3Ls. Um, and so, of course, one of the benefits of being on the law review or any journal in general, really, is that you have folks who have come before you who are now practicing attorneys. Right. And so we found, of course, with like our, our school being in Houston and a lot of our alums now practicing in Houston, that we have that direct connection to them, right? And so it doesn't matter if we're even in the same interest area of law. Right. If you see that I'm on the law review, we now have that connection and that's something that we can talk about. And so there are a ton of opportunities to connect. We have an alumni board actually. And so they have a very heavy hand in like keeping track on what's going on with the law review. Mm-hmm. They help us with like making sure that we have networking events with some alums as well as events within the boards to ensure that we are, you know, a cohesive unit. Um, and so there's just a ton of opportunities. A lot of our alums, they come back and they either join our board of directors or they will just participate in panels that are hosted by the law center in general. Right. Um, and so there are endless opportunities to connect. You can always just like reach out as well. Like look at their bio, see that they're on law review or they went to UH and just connect in that way. So yeah. they're always willing to help. No, I've, I've absolutely had that. Like in, in any, in most interviews for most like firms that I interviewed for, it was somebody within like in that panel you know say it was like a callback with eight people like it was very likely one of them at least was on houston law review at at some point in their life and so it it was always cool i mean did you always talk about it not necessarily some people like don't love law review like the three of us do but like i mean it was always something that's a connection and and they i'm sure you know they saw it and and some of them i did talk about it you know you talk about the law review and your experience on it and everything um i also think on the more internal like networking side i mean you, you also get to work with your own, or there's 35 people in our class, our own 35 peers, the 35-ish people in the class above us when we were 2Ls, mm-hmm. and now the 35-ish people below us. And so that's a, 105 students that you're going to work with that aren't necessarily in your first year section where, you know, that's normally where you, where you meet a lot of people. But even when you're in class with people, I mean, there's not a lot of group projects in law school. And yeah. so, like, you don't really get that kind of exposure. And so, and the legal markets, it's, it's very... Um, People move around a lot, right? And so you, you kind of start to get to know people and spaces. And if you're you know, you know if you're not happy, I know all of us are happy with what we're doing after. Um, but like, but if you're not happy or you, you realize you want you want to change, like you're gonna know 105 people more intimately than you might just your normal peer, mm-hmm. um, or at least a lot of them. And I think that's always been the advice that I've gotten. The first place to network is the people that you know. Yeah. And you're building this network of people who are all in law school. They're all going to do something great after law school, whether that's they're going to go to a firm or they're going to go to government work or they're going to do some Mm -hmm. type of JD Advantage job. Like they're going to do something great with their lives. And you know that person and you had a shared experience with them. And you can develop and nurture that connection for the rest of your professional career. Yeah. And and, and all those people know that, you know, you have a a similar skill set, which we've already talked about 
to what they have, which is which is great because you already can kind of tell like this person's more more likely than not going to still have good attention to detail. Um, or if you work for them and they don't have good attention to detail, I'm just kidding. That doesn't happen often. <laughs> we, we we straighten those people out. <laughs> Shannon does. It's a learning curve. It's a learning <laughs> curve does. for everybody. <laughs> yeah, um, I think maybe one of the other big ones. It's it's a why for some people, and maybe it's not a why for some people, but is publication. So students can get published. We've talked about that. Um, what does that process look like? Um, so we don't actually have as much of an ha- a hand in the publication process. It's actually the board before us because mm-hmm. we submit our pieces to get reviewed by the previous board. Um, and so we haven't actually gone through the selection process just yet for the publication for our following board. But okay. nonetheless, like I mentioned, all the students will write a note or a comment um, and students will actually fill out a survey or, or identify in some way whether or not they actually want to get published. And we try to respect that um, decision, right? Like if somebody doesn't want to get published, then we make sure that they don't get published. But if they do, then we really try to do what we can to make sure that they get uh, that opportunity. Um, and so we're typically looking for those things that we're looking for in a, in a professional piece, right? Like we're looking to see like, is this a topic and an article that's written in such a way that we would want to read it, right? Like, is this something that, you know, we were to pick up this law review that we would want to actually sit and actually read all these pages. Um, we're looking to see that, you know, the citations are in correct blue book format. Mm-hmm. Um, to some extent, they're not going, going to be perfect. The professional pieces aren't perfect, but right. are you attempting to put your citations in, in you know, correct format? Um, and then just, you know, thinking about like how they fit together with the other pieces as well, right? Like right. we don't want to have all of our student pieces on the same like constitutional law topic or even just in the constitutional law area, right? So thinking about how do we get a variety of topics right. to ensure that if these pieces are published, if we're looking to publish them, that we mm-hmm. can have a, a, a wider um, scope of like the legal issues that are going on. Um, and so, so those are some of the things that we'll look for. And then, of course, like thinking about numbers, right? Like we want to be mindful of like how long will our issues be and how many student pieces can we actually take to publish? How long do student pieces have to be? For those for those who don't want to, you know, write like a novel, mm-hmm. what's, what, is, what is that minimum requirement? Because it's also the requirement for just the note and comment piece. Yeah. So the minimum is 8,000 words. Mm-hmm. Um, usually the maximum is 16,000 words. I don't know. Do we have that. any of those? No. We, uh, although Keep me off that issue. <laughs> our board, you know, some folks on our board, they, they were pretty close, but we didn't, yeah. we didn't get, you know, it wasn't 16,000. But you could tell that people on our board definitely took the time, you know, and they really were committed. Mm-hmm. Some of our student pieces are actually longer than some of our professional pieces, which I'm not sure that that's happened often in the past, but it's really cool to see how committed folks were to writing their note and their comment um, and that they get the chance to publish it. And if you're worried, my my comment or or note, I don't know which one it is, comment, right? My comment, comment. my comment is only 8,100 words, I think. So, so you don't, and and it's getting published. So you don't have to, uh, you don't have to write more than that. If you, I mean, but like, also you have to still cover a lot of stuff. I just write Mm -hmm. pretty concisely. So, and I think it's important to remember that's Uh not like 8,000 words and then citations. We try to go for a 50, 50, what we call above the line, below the line. So text and citations. So really you're thinking about, you know, roughly like 4,000 words ish Mm -hmm. above the line, um, and 4,000 words ish below the line. So, you know, it's not like you got to go write this 8,000 word paper and then cite everything. Right, right, and also makes it, make, it also makes reading it faster too. Because yeah. like if you're reading the, if you're reading the above the line text, you know you're not. I, I don't know about you all. I, I don't read when I read an academic scholarly article like every single below the line footnote. It's just when I'm like, hmm, like I don't know what I, how I feel about that, or like, mm-hmm. oh, I want to learn more, and then that's when you might jump to that footnote mm-hmm. and kind of read a little bit more in depth. I think that's also where like well, two things, right? One, what we were talking about with like breaking down a bigger. Uh, responsibility into smaller pieces that's what that matters right because like if you're going to do these citations you have to make sure that you have enough research that you can actually write uh, or like put in enough citations that you have a 50 50 ratio Mm -hmm. on each page Um, but then that's also where like your blue booking skills matter right if you know how to like use different blue books blue booking skills to actually buffer some of those citations parentheticals or yeah string sites like those sorts of things that like if you're not well versed in the blue book and thinking about like how can I actually like buff these citations up, you might make your job a lot harder than it needs to be when you're writing that note or that comment. So I think that's right. where those site checking skills really do come into play when you're writing uh, yeah. your piece. 
I think it's also important to know that nobody goes this process alone. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So we assign a right. notes and comments yes. editor who's a 3L who's gone through this process to our 2Ls. Uh, they're in small groups where there are a couple of 2Ls to each 3L. And then we encourage everybody to talk to a professor, which is you know not mm -hmm. only a great opportunity to develop a relationship with a professor, but also a great opportunity to get someone who does know what they're talking about to tell you where you're going wrong. Right, yeah. And, and also I would say, if this seems like a lot of work, if you write your note or comment very well the first time, you know, if you put a lot of effort into it, and for, for us, like I wrote mine in the fall, I think most people write theirs in the fall, it doesn't end up being this like crazy hectic process, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you go through and ensure your blue, blue book well, if you ensure that you, as you're citing things that you're actually like pulling those sources in and like storing them somewhere so you can refer to them back if you need to, it ends up being a pretty efficient process. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you, you know, every time you write something, you don't like cite the right page or anything, then you have to go back. And if you're like, kind of just put it all down and, and like, I mean, there's going to be revisions, right? But you can really like, to really mitigate the amount of time it takes you to kind of go through that process. Um, if you plan ahead and put the effort in on the front end. So yeah, yeah, totally agree. Just kind of, kind of the advice for all of Law, law review or law journals. <laughs> They're all law school. Law yeah, school. Really, Don't really push all. it all to the end. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we also, we'll turn our notes and our comments into turn it in and we're very serious about plagiarism. And so that's right. another push for students to take it seriously as they're going through the process. Because mm -hmm. if you do, like you're saying, if you're really sloppy with your citations and your pin sites to pages, then yeah. you run the risk of plagiarizing, which could then affect your legal career. Like we're not just talking your membership on right. the bar review, like yeah. we're talking law school. So it matters a lot and we take that very seriously as well. And so that helps with, with pushing students to make sure that they're really diligent. In yeah. their don't, don't plagiarize. <laughs> Please don't, don't just do don't that. do it. Don't do that. In, in any law school. Um, <laughs> awesome. I think one part we haven't talked about yet, which is for sure Houston Law Center specific. I don't know if every single, I, I'm quite sure there are some journals that don't do this, but in Houston Law Center, we get credits, right? Mm -hmm. And so how many credits do you get for being on the journal? Um, so it varies by journal. For mm -hmm. the Houston Law Review specifically, it also varies by position. Mm -hmm. um, and so, as you can imagine, the more time that you have to put into your position, the more credits you'll get. Yes. Um, so the maximum number of credits that we offer are seven cre credits, and that goes towards graduation. Um, mm -hmm. The nice thing about how, and the minimum, let me start there, the minimum actually is four. Okay. Um, and we do not give credits to our 2Ls. They're essentially working to earn their credits as a 2L. Your number of credits really um, are based again on your position. So once you get that 3L position, you now can use your credits based on, you know, however you choose to use it based on your schedule. So right. folks can decide to use all of them in one semester. They can split them up. You don't have to use all of your credits. Um, some people, you know, they, they have enough. But we do get those credits as a 3L and we can apply them as we see fit, which is really nice. Because I know that not all law schools give credits to their students. Yes, I am only taking eight credits of real class a semester as a 3L. Because and of your law, law review And credits? law review is helping out a decent amount of that. Yeah, yeah nice. and, and like summer classes and stuff, but yeah. Um, I think another thing to, to note on the credit side, which is a big why in my opinion of why to do law review, is like, I think the school normally sees like one credit is like 60 hours of work, right? Mm -hmm. For like at least like externships and if you're gonna be like a teaching assistant or tutor or something like that. Um, and on, on law review, I think that, that plays out, at least it, it, or really all the journals, I think it plays out either pretty equally to that or maybe even in your favor a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to think six credits at 60 hours is 360 hours. And yeah, maybe you're going to spend 30-ish hours on your five issues that you side check. That's 150 hours. You maybe spend 30, 40 hours on writing your requirement. But I mean, and then that still leaves like almost 200 hours on that 3L side, which... Maybe I think you all are probably uh, not gonna. <laughs> you get an extra credit though. You get an extra credit, <laughs> but, but, but but like, but again, like you, you all get the incredible experience of, of being able to like have that higher position where you get a lot of leadership experience. Um, and depending on how many episodes I, I end up doing by the time this episode publishes, it'll, it'll show how close or over I go. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it can it can definitely be an advantageous way, and it's it's credits that are in your control that mm -hmm. you're not getting an exam on, mm -hmm. which is incredible. Right. And you're like, not getting a grade. And so not getting a grade. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so differs by law center, but here. And I think U of H is pretty generous. Having yeah. talked mm -hmm. to some people at other schools, you know, I was hearing one Get credit, one two. two credits. Ugh. And I thought, wow, yeah, Dear I'll Lord. take my seven any day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We do publish a lot of material though. We do. Yes, we do. Yeah. We a lot of issues. Um, do you all have any other whys before I move on to the, the who, when, and where? I don't think so. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. So... 
at this point, if you stayed this long, you're probably interested, right? You're probably thinking, I want to do a journal. And so, but we need to know who is eligible for law journals. Um, and so I think one of the big things is like a, a grade or class rank requirement. So what does that look like for journals or for law review in specific? Um, yes. Yeah, so first, we're only eligible to students who have completed their first year of law school. Right. Um, that includes transfer students. They still have to have completed their first year of law school. We do take part time students and mm -hmm. what the first year of law school looks like, of course, is a little bit different. But ultimately, they have completed one full year of law school. Right. Um, we do have a grade requirement that cutoff can change year to year. Yeah. Traditionally, at least for the past few years that, that we've known, it, um, we have students who can grade on to the law review, meaning if you have uh, scored in the top 10% of your class, mm -hmm. your graduating class, or your specific section, you are then eligible to just get on to the law review. You'll receive an invitation on, and you can decide whether or not you want to accept that invitation. Right. Um, if you fall below the top 10%, but you are above the top 35%, maybe the top 40%, okay. um, you can then write on to the law review. And so that requires writing a case note it's mm -hmm. usually about 20 to 25 pages and you're given a case and there's a whole process with that. But um, essentially you are writing, again, a legal novel argument about a case um, and that's submitted and reviewed by members of the law review. And then students are invited on that way. Yeah. Um, so grades are important. Um, I think it's something that we need to talk about a lot more. I think that right. if you're a student who's coming into law school and you don't know much about how everything works, um, you might not find out about those grade requirements until it's too late. As I said, those things can change, but ultimately recognizing that if you are interested in joining a law review, your grades will matter. Mm -hmm. um, and so really trying to put in that effort as a first year law student to do the best that you can, um, it's important. And of course, the nice part is that we consider the first year um, I know in the past they've considered the first semester, but we considered the first yeah. year. And so that gives you time to fix your mistakes if you didn't know certain things your first semester, which most of us don't know right. things our first semester. Um, and yeah, so that's how you can get, get on and you're eligible. Um, we don't care once you're on the law review how you made it on. Mm -hmm. um, most of our members probably don't even know how their peers made it on to no the idea. law review. Um, that's information that folks can choose to disclose, but it's not something that, you know, me or Shannon or anyone else is going around saying, right. you know, how folks made it onto the law review. Ultimately, once you have been given an invitation to join, you are a mm -hmm. member of our organization and we don't care how you made it on. There's no discussion about grades. Your grades are not considered when it comes to your 3L positions and what you're interested in. Um, it's just these are just two different avenues right. to get onto the law review. Um, and that's it. Yeah, absolutely true. I have no idea who's written or graded on, nor do I care. Yeah, uh, you know. you're all doing the same yeah, work at the end the of the day. And you're, you know, and, you're all busy. Yeah. And if you're not a one L in your spring when this when this episode is publishing, and you're wondering how do I how do I do well in school, we have another episode of the series, so check that out. Um, it'll be our first episode of the Law School Real Talk series. But it's really part of the reason we're doing this is because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't know. I mean, I, I, I was lucky enough to have a wife that um, was in law school ahead of time. And uh, Shannon, you said you, you had somebody in your family, but I think a lot of people don't have anyone to mentor them and kind of tell them any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's important. And I think you, you've kind of covered also charisma, a little bit of the, the when is when you should, should you start thinking about uh, law journals. And I think, I mean, it grades matter. So as soon as you, as soon as you start, you gotta, you gotta start if that's your goal, you gotta start backwards planning and, and trying to get those grades. But there are other journals, right, that that don't require, and I, I know none of us are really experts on the other journals, but there are some that don't require a top percentile, right? They allow, like, for legal writing, at least in Houston, um, and it's like there's ones that are like A or A minus, right? Mm -hmm, that's right. A or A minus. So yeah. you don't have to be a great tester, and you could still mm -hmm. be on a, on, a, on a legal journal. And I, we haven't really gotten into this super in depth, but I am kind of curious just to touch upon it. How does, how does Law Review compare to other legal journals? Like, what, what is the difference, really? Or is there one at all? You want to take that? In, at U of H? Other yeah, journals? yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's hardest to get onto Law Review as mm -hmm. the flagship journal at U of H and the journal that's been there the longest. Um, we have the toughest standards for people to get on. Sure. So, you know, in terms of, like, you're going to have to have a really good n note or comment if you're writing on mm -hmm. um, your grades 
are going to have to be in the top percent if you're grading on and no right. other journal requires top 10 percent. So getting on law review is really an accomplishment and anyone who gets on to law review should feel really proud of being there regardless of what path they took to, to get there. And I think another thing that's important to add because we get this question is that for, for Houston Law Review and for most of the journals at U of H, we only recruit rising 2Ls. Okay. So it's not something where you know you work hard your 1L year and you think, you know, I'm really not ready for a journal. I'll wait till 3L year. Most of the journals, I think there's one journal that allows 3Ls to come on. So. Uh, but most of the journals, like you've got to get on 2L yeah. year and then they'll keep you for 3L year, right. but you're not going to have another chance a year later. So uh, to your point, you really got to start thinking about it from the time you come in to law school. If it's something that's important to you and working toward that and preparing for trying to write on or grade on for your 2L year. Absolutely. I think besides grading requirements, I think one other thing maybe that differs between law, I mean, because all, all of them, I mean, I think, again, none of us have are been in a different journal, I don't think, but they all operate fairly similarly, right? Mm -hmm. Like they all publish academic scholarly things. I think other journals are also more probably specific. Yeah. Like, you know, we, we have one on like tax and business, we have one on more international things. And so normally, like, everything you publish is going to be within that sphere whereas with our law review and, and i would assume probably all our law reviews m much more broader swath of, of topics and things and so i think that's probably the other major difference mm -hmm. between like a law review or flagship journal for a school and other more specialized journals mm -hmm. we also publish more issues so yeah, right you know a little, little bit more work there yeah. but uh we have five issues a year and i know some of the journals at u of h have like two issues a year or mm -hmm. three issues a year so, you know, if that fits better with your schedule right. and you're interested in that area, by all means, go for that. Um, but, Absolutely. you know, it's, it's important to us to put out this, a significant amount of scholarship every year. And our journal has been putting out five issues for quite a while. Yeah. And I think two things that I want to note. One is that, um, of course, yes, being on the law review is a privilege and it is a, it has its benefits, as we've discussed. Mm -hmm. However, the skills that you learn on the law review are similar skills that you'll learn on any legal journal. And so, as Shannon was saying, if law review doesn't work for your schedule or if for whatever reason you don't have the grades and you can't make it on, like it is still beneficial to join a journal because yes. those skills still matter. And there are certain things that you might look into doing. Like, for example, when I was applying for clerkships, the judges, sure, they looked for like, are you on law review? But they were mm -hmm. also asking like, are you on a journal? Right. And so those skills and those that experience still matters. Um, the second thing that I wanted to note, though, is I encourage all law students to not close any doors for themselves. I think if you are eligible to write on to the law review, I would highly suggest doing it. Um, yes, it, it does take time from your summer, like 20 to 25 pages sounds like a lot. At times, it was a lot during the summer. I won't, I wrote on to the law review, and it, it was a lot at times. But mm -hmm. again, it's it's doable. Um, we have the same requirements for our write-on as we do for our note and our comment. So the case note also has that 50-50 ratio. Right. Um, and I just think that, that law students shouldn't close any doors for themselves. They never know. Mm -hmm. You know, you just never know what you might be interested in later on. You never know who you might meet or what firm you might become interested in or anything. And I just I was just encouraged not to not close those doors. Um, and to just really take advantage of every opportunity that you have in law school. It feels long, but those three years go by really, really quickly. Right. And a lot of things can change in those three years in terms of your interests. And so the more things that you have on your resume that can then open doors for you, I think the better position you're in to take advantage of any options that, that you might be interested in later on. Absolutely. And at U of H, we have one write-on competition for all the journals. Yeah. So okay. we do that jointly. So it's not like you've got to try to write on to HLR process. and try yeah. to write on to yeah. the business and tax journal. You can just do it one time and then you'll get your offers and you know, hopefully you have multiple offers and you can decide which one best fits with your life. Right. But I mentioned that though, because of the different requirements with grades, right? Like you might not be eligible to grade onto the law review. So you might have to write for the law review, but you might be eligible to just grade onto another journal. And so, yeah, that might be the easier route in terms of not having to take up time during the summer. But mm -hmm. I think ultimately when you think about those like long-term benefits, um, I think that those can pay off in a way that you might not be thinking about when you've just finished finals. And now you're thinking about this major task of writing a case note. Um, I just think thinking, playing that long-term game matters, especially when you're in law school and you plan on having a long legal career. Yeah, 100%. And if you're wondering where should I go more to learn about law journals, I can tell you for the Houston Law Review, you should go to HoustonLawReview.org. Um, but I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I think all law journals have their own webs, or most have their own websites, especially like a lot of schools like flagship journals have websites and electronic versions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's also helpful to look up um, the publications 
Um, of course, we publish on Hein Online. Our articles mm. are available on Lexis and Westlaw. And so getting a sense of like the type of scholarship right. that's being published can also help in terms of understanding the law review a little bit more. Like I said, I didn't know anything about law reviews, but reading the case notes of students who had written on before, like reading law review articles to actually write my case note or my note for um, my writing requirement, that right. helped to get a better sense of like, what are we really doing? And like, why does this matter? Yeah. And to see how those things play out when you can look at a piece that's been published for years and it mm -hmm. still matters and it's still relevant, I think really helps to give um, give a why to all of the work that we're doing when we're on the journal. Right, yeah, I, th I thought it was super helpful, like especially the, the first article that I went through and edited, like I read the full article and everything and that like helped me be like, oh, like, this is how you write and do legal writing. And like still, I think even in like the later part of my publication like process, I would still go back and be like, how did they do a table of contents? Like maybe I should like look and I, and I wouldn't even just stop at the first one. I'd look at like all of the articles I had like kind of edited to be like, oh, get, you know, get some ideas. Like this is probably a good way to like structure that or, or look at like intro or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and, and all, our website, if I'm not mistaken, has everything that we publish also electronically. So mm -hmm. you will see all of our published stuff whenever it comes out, you'll be able to see the, uh, the professors and, and legal writers that, that we, uh, we push out and also people that don't necessarily get pushed in our issues, which is cool. Yeah, and, and our and our online issues, of, of course, as well, because we right. have our online yep, yep. companion. And so mm -hmm. those those issues that we publish on our online companion are usually a bit more um, like practical and a little right. bit shorter, but they're still professional pieces. They're still formatted just like our print issues. Um, and so getting to see that also is, is really cool on our website because we have a lot yeah. of cool pieces there. And if you're sick of reading, you can always check out the podcast on YouTube under Emphasis Added. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think I think this has been great. I, we, we, I think feel like we have really covered the five W's. But I'd like to ask one closing question, which I'm asking everyone in this series, uh, which is if you could give one piece of advice to a first year law student, what would it be? Oh, that's tough. Um, I think I touched on it before, I think. But I think working hard during that first year mm -hmm. is really important. Um, I know for me, like I mentioned, I don't have any attorneys in my family. My brother, he was a he was in law school. He just graduated in May. And so we were sort of figuring this thing out together. Yeah. Um, but knowing the importance of your first year of law school matters. And I think the earlier that you know that, the better off you are. Right. Um, of course, in undergrad or even if you've done any like other professional schools, your first year doesn't really matter as much. Like usually in undergrad, it's like you have time to figure mm -hmm. it out and all those things. But in law school, your first year is the most important year in terms Truly. of employment opportunities, in terms of like journals, as we've just discussed. And so knowing that going in and like really setting yourself up to say, OK, like I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can mm -hmm. this first year matters a lot. Um, and it it's time consuming and sometimes it feels like I can't do this or right. like, why did I sign up for this? But I think once you've made it to the end and you realize like I've put in a lot of work mm -hmm. and I now have options, it matters. And it, it feels really good to, to now say like, OK, I don't think I want to do this type of law. I want to do this. And you can right. pivot really easily because you've set yourself up in that way. And I think also making those connections, putting yourself out there is really important, like emailing random people that you know go to your law school or have gone to your law school and just saying hi like i right. want to have lunch i want to have coffee those things matter mm -hmm. um and so working really hard putting yourself out there and just trying to have fun with it it's yeah. a lot but don't lose sight of who you were before law school still connect <laughs> with your friends and your family because they'll keep you grounded in all of this and, and it definitely gets easier but i think it gets easier faster if you put the effort in especially that first semester like yeah. if you really put the time in things are going to start making sense way quicker than if mm -hmm. you, you know, push that off and have a not as good first semester because you didn't put as much time into it. And it's going to take longer because it's just, it takes time to learn this stuff. Yeah. And so, I think I, I would add plan ahead yep. and always start earlier than you think you need to. Uh -huh. So if you think it's going to take you, you know, three hours to do this reading for class, um, especially your first year, it might take you six. Yeah. So, you know, start where you've got plenty of time. Right. Start ahead of time even where you're feeling like wow I, I don't know that i need to be reading for class on monday because it's only thursday no actually start reading for class on monday on thursday yeah because stuff happens Truly. also in your life we all have lives outside of law school i have children i can't tell you how many times i was doing like torts reading in an urgent care center because my kids <laughs> picked up some bug at the school yeah, yeah, so yeah. you know you just gotta you gotta plan your time and and start earlier than you think you need to so that you can get everything done because it is possible it just 
It's time management. Mm -hmm. And, and I, so I was going to talk about time management. I was also going to ask you what your time management skill was or trick was, because I, <laughs> I know you have kids and, and you still manage to kind of stay ahead of all this stuff. Um, I, I agree. I think it's time management 100%, um, which, which includes working hard, like, like Charisma said. But I think when I hear a lot of people, most people, almost maybe everyone I've ever heard say that they, do, they don't want to do a journal, it's because they don't have the time. Yeah. And so I think if you can build those time management skills, even before you go to law school, but when you're in law school, um, and in a past episode we talk about this more too, but if you can build those skills then you're going to have that time mm -hmm. and and really like truly by you build them by getting ahead of things because that's when unexpected stuff isn't going to get in the way of your ability to succeed in school and do all these things for journal and so yeah i am all in on the time management <laughs> yeah but with that being said um it has been awesome to have both of you on the show uh thank you so much for uh, for being here shannon charisma thank, thank you so you. much kevin it's been a lot of fun awesome. thank you Thanks for listening. Emphasis Added is a podcast by the Houston Law Review. If you like what you heard, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and follow the Houston Law Review on social media or check us out on houstonlawreview.org. Till next time.